15. If you have a familiarity with the scriptures or if you've ever attended a wedding, then you know something of this passage. It's called the love chapter. And it certainly is that, but it is so much more because it was designed, as it falls in 1 Corinthians, to correct uh, one more abuse in the church at Corinth. There were many. If you've been following with us through this letter, you know that Paul has addressed several legitimate concerns about the church at Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 13, as we're thinking through this, looking at this for the fourth time, and we'll look at it a couple more times uh, in the coming weeks, Christian love shapes the Christian life. Christian love shapes the Christian life. When you read through this, and we're going to do that in a minute, and you hear what love is, what it is not, what it does, what it does not, and you say, well, I'm not what it says it is. And I am what it says it's not, and I do what it says love doesn't, and I don't do what it says love does, then you need to seriously check your heart. It's not a sin to discover that you've embraced religion and not embraced Christ. It is a damnable sin, however, to go through life thinking you have embraced Christ and yet living a Christian life that's not been shaped by Christian love. Because remember what we just, Josh was just saying, and it's, it's drawn from Philippians 2 that, folks, it's not a question of any, you or anyone you know, will I bow to Jesus? Philippians 2 says every knee will bow to Jesus. The hope that we have is while we breathe, while there's pink under our fingernail, that, that we will bow to him and confess him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because if we live this life and leave this earth not having engaged in that, not having genuinely bowed the heart and life to Christ, we will bow the hardest people you know will bow one day to their damnation if they do not bow while they live and confess him as Lord. So let's look at this today just again. Let it be a, uh, a mirror, a, a spiritual scan over our lives and ask the honest question, is this me? Is this me? Someone reads this, would they go, I read that and I thought of you. Stand with me if you would as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. Just follow along in your Bible as I read. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you, but we really want to do what we can to be sure that you have your own copy of the Word of God. Beginning in verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man or a woman, I gave up childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. What have we read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may its sufficiency prove powerful in our lives today. Our culture desperately needs a good dose of agape love. Thank you. Please be seated. We told you this passage breaks down into three three areas, the necessity of love, which we looked at in verses 1 through 3, the excellence of love, which we're, which we're looking at now, and then the per- perpetuity of love, it's, it, how it continues. It goes on, and we'll look at that uh, in the coming days. We told you uh, that in this excellence of love, Verses 4 to 7, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. We got that far last week. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Remember, this is agape love, agape kind of love. We, We just... We gave the distinction to you the last couple of Sundays. I won't, I won't bog you down with that again except to say that agape love is, is unconditional love. It was a love in the, in the language of the Greek outside of Christianity, but when it, when it was brought into uh, the language of the New Testament, when Jesus took it up, it really was transformed. It's a love that says, I love you, regardless. That's how Jesus loves us, by the way. We sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He loves us with an everlasting love. He set his heart upon us in eternity past. And he comes in the fullness of time to live and keep the perfect law of God perfectly, never sinning. He does this for people like you and me who were commanded to keep the law of God and and did not. In fact, let's be honest. Scripture says they go astray from the womb speaking lies. When I was a little boy, before I could recite the Ten Commandments, I was was sinning. I was sinning. I didn't become a sinner because I was sinning. I was sinning because I was born a sinner by nature. And so before we were encountered with objective truth, to tell us what God's law, God's will is. We are sinners. Did anyone here who who's, is raising, has raised children ever have to teach them to disobey so that you could tell them no when they disobey? Did you ever sit down with your child and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You see that, that real pretty thing on my coffee table over there? I want you to go try to grab it, and I'm going to tell you no Did you ever have to do that? No. Depravity said, hmm, I see that thing. I want it. You don't believe in depravity, just just serve in the nursery time to time. I have grandchildren in there. They're precious, but they're depraved. Guess what? They're in there with your depraved children too. They fuss over things. They fight over things. They, they totally ignore a toy until what? A child picks it up. <laughs> Suddenly, that's the most valuable item in the room. Right? You know what I'm talking about. That, that's not something the parents taught them. It works itself out. Depravity does that. Okay, so, so we come in with this problem. And Jesus loves us just like we are, but his love comes to us not to allow us to stay like we are, but to transform us into people who reflect his love. That's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about who Jesus is and what he's like, 
and what, what we become when we become like him, when we come to trust him, okay? So let's, let's look at this. It's not so much a description, one writer said, as a depiction of love in action. Paul is implying, and you're going to see this when we get to chapter 14, he's contrasting here the, uh, the behavior of those in Corinth who were placing an inordinate value on the spectacular gifts or the remarkable gifts. We're going to see that in chapter 14. So we've thought about this. We told you last week, love is patient. It's long-tempered. It's got a long fuse. When you flame, stop loving. Love is kind. It's gentle. It's a, it's a compliment, a friend, to love is patient. There's a disposition of kindness that shows itself. Love does good to those who want to do us harm. Third, love does not envy. Need a good dose of that when those children are fighting over toys, don't we? We need a good dose of that in, in just the public arena today, don't we? Adults who act like children. Who don't think that just because someone else has something, that that's not right if they themselves don't have it. That is the motor that drives this generation. You realize that, don't you? It's called the politics of envy. Need a good dose of agape love inserted there. Love doesn't boast. It's not, not full of itself. I, me, my, mine. In the movie Nemo, where the little fish finds himself in the middle of a bunch of seagulls. Remember that scene? Powerful. And if you've been around seagulls, you know, they, kind of, they sound kind of like that, don't you? And I hadn't really thought about that. I grew up around them down the Gulf Coast. But when I saw that scene, I thought, wow. And we saw them recently crossing the, the Galveston Bay flying over, and guess what they were saying? They throw something up, they fight over it. Fight over it so much that, that a piece of bread may well fall into the water because they were fighting over getting it. Love doesn't do that. Not full of itself. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. Well, I just tell you what I think. Hmm. Well, at some point along the way, a Christian ought to learn to speak what Jesus thinks. We're supposed to be being conformed to the image of Christ. Jesus was not rude. He was forthright. Even when he rebuked, he rebuked in love. Jesus never did anything of which he should be ashamed. That's, that's the idea of it's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way, number seven. It's, it's not got to be my way or the highway. It's interesting. Have you ever thought about it in life? If husband and wife, uh, parents and children, church, school, the office, different arenas. If you had people in there operating, wanting Jesus to be glorified as the head over this matter. If, if all parties were functioning that way, it would take on a very different look, wouldn't it? What it would look like is us showing deference. That's what, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 5 when he's talking about what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is a, that is a practice. You go first. No, you. No, 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 you. No, 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 you. I, no, I, and that would be the, that'd be the nature, of the, the close thing you come to conflict is showing deference to one another. Love doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. 
Now, so-and-so is a Christian, but you really need to tiptoe around that person. You never know what's going to set him or her off. That sounds so wrong. When I showed up at a church decades ago now to be pastor, folks took me aside and said, now look, Miss So-and-so is willing to come back and hear you to see what you're going to be like, but don't, don't do anything to offend her. So why? Well, she, she'll leave. She's been gone, she was gone a long time with the last pastor, and now she's coming back. Wow. That's a great mark of sanctification. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't harbor, harbor resentment. I can never get over it. Oh, oh. He hurt my feelings. How long ago was that? Twelve years ago. Really? Really? So in all the, in all the washing, those, those, those spiritual baths where the Word washes over you, that's never healed that wound? You got some defective grace there. It's not resentful. One version says, doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I visited someone one time talking and, and they said, uh, well, I'll never forgive nor f- forget what so-and-so did. I thought, never? We forgive one another as God in Christ forgave. Can you imagine... Jesus drawing near to you and saying, you know, I saved you. I forgave you of your sins, but I will never forgive you what you just did. That's not even a Christianity worth sharing with anybody. See, love doesn't do that. Well, we get to the day. Love does not rejoice. Number 10, love does not rejoice with wrongdoing. Paul says in Romans 1 that one of the problems of a culture where God's, where God's taking his hand off the culture, he says not only do they know that doing such things is wrong, but they rejoice, they encourage when others practice it with them. Brothers and sisters, that is a description of the day in which we live. And I was telling John, it's getting worse and worse. I can't even say to you in, in, in polite company the things that have come down the pike just this week in a a new wave of assault upon this culture. And people promote it. They glory in it. And I'm going to tell you something. While I believe the Lord's watches over his own, he kept kept the light on in Goshen when the Israelites were enslaved there when it was stygian darkness in Egypt. So God can do that. I know he can. But I want to tell you something. This culture in this country is doomed. Doomed. There's not a man on the planet who can serve as leader of the free world in our White House who can head off what is coming to this culture. Remember now, God judges actively fire and brimstone raining down out of the sky, but he also judges passively when he simply removes his hand from a culture. Paul says that in Romans 1. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. And this is where you live. And I, I, don't want, I don't want to sound like a doomsday prophet. I'm not a doomsday prophet. I've read the end of the story. We win. It's going to work out great for those who know the Lord. Okay? We've got to be honest where we are. Love does not rejoice with wrongdoing. Our hearts should be broken when people commit sin. I've known people who, who are giddy when public figures or or pastors or others are caught in scandalous sin. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I, 
That ought to break people's hearts. This was one of Paul's charges earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, that these people should have been brokenhearted when they found out that there was a man in the congregation who was carrying on in, a, in an inappropriate, intimate way with, with his stepmother. Paul said, you should have been ashamed. You live in a culture that rejoices when somebody is engaged in wrongdoing whether they're advancing an agenda or whether they turn out to be a hypocrite because they seem to be against that agenda and they're caught in the very thing they said they opposed. Doesn't do that. This is one of those differences in this list. It doesn't do this, but it does do this. It's a direct contrast, but love rejoices with the truth, number 11. It joyfully sides with the truth. Now this is, this is a challenge because truth is slain in the streets. Truth will get you knocked in the head if you happen to walk into uh, a parade <laughs> or a riot or a protest of, of the Antifa crowd, the anti-fascists who are really fascist. Um, a fellow, one of, their, one of their supporters, just showed up with an American flag recently to protest the flag. He just had it. And they, they beat the stuffings out of him. So somebody that's actually for truth is in danger today, but we rejoice in it. We don't back down from it. Our brothers and sisters in Christ in the first century were fed to the lions because of their rejoicing in the truth. They were called into the arena, the Colosseum, and said, confess that Caesar is your Lord. And they would say, no, Jesus is my Lord. They rejoiced in the gospel. They rejoiced in God, the advance of God's truth. By the way, though, don't have to look back 20 centuries. Brother Norman told us about India today. Our brothers and sisters in Christ in India are being slaughtered today because they rejoice in the truth of Jesus Christ. They don't compromise with their culture. They don't say, well, you know, Jesus, we love Jesus, but whatever works for you, no. We love Jesus. And you need to repent and follow Jesus. Hundreds of churches, two weeks ago, hundreds of churches in China were destroyed and Christians rounded up. And what are they doing? It's just not fair. No, they're rejoicing in the truth. They're rejoicing in the truth. Church in China and church around the world by and large, when they're, when they're persecuted, they rejoice. They go forth rejoicing like they did in the book of Acts for, for being counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. In other words, what a privilege that people so recognized us, identified us with Jesus, that they beat the stuffings out of us, took everything we had. Love rejoices with the truth. And that's a powerful witness, by the way. I'll never forget John Piper saying one time at a conference where we were, he said, he said, have you ever thought about what it looked like to go to battle in the Old Testament? If your captain of the army said, I want you and you and you and you on the front line charging forward today, leading the attack. In the Old Testament, in those battles, that was a sure certainty that you would not return from battle. You would be killed on the field. John Piper made this observation. He said, we need to keep sending waves and waves and platoons and armies of missionaries overseas until Muslims and, and Hindus and those who kill our missionaries have the bodies stacked so high that they say, what is it that these people believe that makes them willing to lay down their lives like this? That's love, rejoicing in the truth. And then we get into these little pithy responses. Love bears all things. Number 12, love bears all things. It, it puts up with a lot. Someone might say to, you know, in fact, they said this to my mother years ago, decades ago. They would come to her and say, why do you put up with your husband? I heard women from the church when I was a child, they would come to see my mother and say, you need to leave him. You need to leave him. Why do you put up with your husband? Her answer, she said, because I love God and I love him 
and I made a promise when I married him. Love bears all things. It bears up under. It's one of the demonstrations. You know, Karen and I have been married 44 years now, and I know for some of you we're just, we're just pikers. We're just getting started. I understand that. And I applaud those of you that have been married much longer than we have. God bless you for setting that example. When we said I do that night, stars in our eyes, all decked out in a tux and a beautiful dress. We meant it, but we had no idea what I do would mean. <laughs> you know? I mean, at that point, she laughed at all my jokes. She told me how wonderful I was. I thought, man, this is going to be great. And we hadn't been married very long before I began to discover some flaws that I had. Now, I would like to tell you it was self-discovery, but it was not. I was assisted in that discovery. I never knew. I never knew. I twitched my toes when I slept. One night, she says, what is that noise? What noise? It sounds like a cricket is in here. I listened. I didn't hear it. I went on back to sleep. Nudge, nudge. I hear it again. I said, I'm not hearing it. I'm back to sleep. Finally, she nudged me. She said, it's you. What? She said, you're twitching your toes. I'd never heard myself twitch my toes. Just like to this day, I have never heard myself snore. But I'm told I do. So I had to learn to sleep, not twitch. She said, I can't get to sleep with that noise. What's the point I'm making? That, so for 44 years, we've had this wonderful opportunity to say, I still do, bearing all things. She's put up with a lot. You think you have? She's put up with a lot. I put up with a little bit. But we still do. Because love bears. Love bears. It's, I tell people, when I'm, when I'm teaching young couples who are talking about getting married or people in the midst, that it's, it's when you come at odds with one another in marriage. That is the first opportunity you have. For, do we really have agape love? If our marriage had started out and continued with her just kind of bouncing around me like Tigger, telling me how wonderful I am, then I could have, the thing we could have shared would have been me being in love with me and she being in love with me. But it's when we cross that you find, is this agape love? Am I going to listen to that? Am I going to bear up under that? Are we going to seek reconciliation, which is the power of the gospel? Love does that. It endures. It supports. Thirteen, love believes all things. Now, this is not a call to gullibility. But it is a call to practice the Bible's teaching that we're to we're to think more highly of others than we ought. We're to esteem others better than ourselves. We are to submit to one another, believing the best. It's a, it's a lost art today in the church. A lost art. I've told you a story before. I was at a church, and we went through incredible challenges in terms of reformation. And uh, one of my deacons came to me one day, and I'd been there at this point seven years. He said, well, I heard something today, and it was outrageous. I mean, it was that, that I had said that the Methodist pastor was going to hell because he was playing, they used to have, they had these video game things in the local grocery store of this small town. Because he was standing there playing video games that I said he was going to hell. 
which was nonsense. I mean, I didn't know. My own kids were playing the little Nintendo in, in television back at home. You know, what kind of a hypocrite would I have been? And so uh, I said, no, I didn't say that. He said, are you sure? I said, oh, Lord, help me. Because I said, did you tell folks that wasn't true? Well, did you say it? Thanks for believing the best. It's a lost art, dear people. And yet, agape love believes the best. Let me give this caveat. Until someone shows you that they are so willing to lie to you repeatedly as a serial liar that you cannot, in, in wisdom, take them at their word because they've proven that their word is wrong. But everybody, we ought to go into every relationship believing this person is going to tell me the truth. I have no reason to believe this person wouldn't tell me the truth. I have no reason to believe these terrible things about this person. I'm, I'm going to believe the best about them. Love, love does that. Agape, see, we give that to one another. And if, if our conduct becomes habitual so that we take that away, that's, that's, that's a sin. That's the person's problem. But we give that to one another. Love does that. Yet we live in a culture that is highly suspicious. Hmm. wonder what he wants. What does this mean? What's not being said? That's the way the world operates. The world thinks the worse. A fellow said one time, he said, you know, he said, a rumor or a lie can go around the world twice before the truth gets out of bed. <laughs> it spreads. It spreads. I knew some people in a small town where I pastored that if I wanted the whole town to know it, I wouldn't publish it in the newspaper. That was way too slow. Just let this person know. Love doesn't do that. Love believes all things. Love, 14, hopes all things. It's hopeful. That's why when I speak to you sometimes very frankly from this pulpit about how the culture is going to Gehenna as quickly as it can, I'm not, I'm not doom and gloom. I'm really not. I'm concerned for your children, for my grandchildren, but I'm not doom and gloom. Because if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're coming through, brothers and sisters. We're coming through. The first century Christians were, were admitted to heaven by the, by the hundreds and thousands as they were slaughtered and, and it became the portal for them to go to be with Jesus. Today, today, do you realize in the last hundred years there were more Christians martyred for the faith than in the previous 1900 years combined? It's happening today. We're hopeful. We're hopeful when, a, when, a, when someone goes by the wayside. The temptation is to write them off. Say, Psh. That was a waste of time. No, love hopes all things. Love says, let me back. Love says, maybe I was not the one to reach them. God brings someone into their lives that reaches them. See, love doesn't get, let itself get driven to utter despair. Does love, does the person who practices agape love find himself or herself despairing? Sure, any of us can take a blow. We can walk out of this building today and you get a text or a phone call that'll change what you thought this day was going to be like. But it doesn't drive you to utter despair because love, agape love, hopes under all circumstances. Because Jesus is the blessed hope, you see? He's the blessed hope. We haven't anchored our hopes to terra firma here. We haven't anchored our hopes in anyone's life choices. We haven't even anchored our hopes in how perfectly we can live. We have anchored our hopes in Jesus Christ who is the blessed hope. And he does not disappoint. And he will not make us ashamed. Paul says that in Romans. Hope, hope does not bring you to be ashamed. Love hopes. And then love endures all things. Jesus, and it's, and it's going somewhere with this, the next statement. 
Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, so we say, well, wait a minute, aren't we saved by grace through faith? Don't we believe in once saved, always saved? What we believe is that once a person is saved, once a person is truly in grace, that person will endure, will persevere to the end. I had a professor in seminary who told me this. I've mentioned it to you a dozen times since I've been with you. A faith that fizzles was false from the first because love endures. It's one of the marks. If you know a person who's given up on Christianity, you have to do two things. You have to wonder if they ever were saved and Two, you have to hope <laughs> that they will be recovered or ultimately saved. See, there's no time in our lives, brothers and sisters, this changes the way we see things if we will embrace this agape love. You and I should never give up on anybody as long as they have pink under the fingernails. Kids, do you know what that means? If you got pink under the fingernails, you know what that means? That means you still got blood flowing. And if you still got blood flowing, you still got a heartbeat. And when the heart ceases to beat, then life ceases to be. And the fingernail won't be pink, it'll go white. We endure. No matter how bad it gets. And we're not going to get a pass. If your theology teaches you that America gets a pass, throw it in the trash. It's an insult to the 50 the Christians in 50 countries that we study every year, that we pray about every year. And we're about to hit the top 10. And it's really bloody in the top 10. We don't get a pass. I was talking with a pastor the other day. We were discussing this matter. Three strokes of a pen. Executive orders, orders, not acts of Congress. Three strokes of a pen. Will bring the church, many churches, to their knees. Tax exemptions for contributions, canceled. Property tax exemption for church facilities and grounds, canceled. Minister's housing allowance, canceled. Three signatures, three executive orders. We sit on seven acres of land, I think, five and a half, six and a half, seven. Frontage on two sides. Your contributions cease to have the option to be exempt from taxes. It'll bring all these big campuses, you, these sprawling campuses people boast about, X number of acres. You see, and there's not been a shot fired, nobody arrested. We've got to get ready for this. We have got to embrace agape love and say we're going to love no matter what. God, being my helper, I'm going, to, I'm going to love you with all I am. I'm going to love my brothers and sisters with all that I am. I'm going to, I'm going to love my neighbor with all that I am. I'm going to love my enemies who come against me to destroy me. Because if I kick and scream and fret and fume, I surrender the privilege of being called a follower of Christ because my brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are loving this way and they are being led to the slaughter every day. They are losing everything. Well, how do they bear up? Agape love in them, growing in them. Is that how you and I love? Now, I think the next statement, which is 
part of chapter 8, the first part of chapter 8. I think it can be added to this, but I think it's a bridge statement. So we're going to pick it up when we, but it says love never ends. I understand that to mean love never stops loving. I want to ask you today, is there anyone in your life that you've stopped loving? Anyone in your life that you've given up on? It's tempting sometimes. See, this text says that doesn't happen for someone who, who has received the agape love of Jesus Christ, the unconditional love of Christ, the Spirit dwelling in us and from us, the Spirit outflowing like rivers of living water in love. Now, folks, this doesn't describe any of us perfectly. doesn't describe me perfectly. No. I, I read over this and prepare to preach this to you, and I think, dear God, help me. Help me. But you know what? He will. Just the whisper of his name. Just the whisper of his name. Jesus. Jesus, who loves with an everlasting love, who, who loved his own who were in the world and showed us unmistakably, infallibly the full extent of your love by submitting to the cruel cross, enduring their atrocities, enduring the wrath of God, Jesus. See, you can't do this on your own. You can try. You won't. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if he has come into your life as your Savior, you've repented of your sins and committed your life to him, all that you are, then the fight is on. The fight for love. And Paul's going to tell us, as we go a more further into this passage, a lot of stuff's going to fall away. There's some stuff that's going to abide. It's going to abide. Chief among them, he's going to say, the greatest of these is agape. Is agape. Oh, God, help us. If we, as families, if we as individuals and families in, in a church would, would commit to love this way and slay anything that looks other, what would that look like? I believe it would be a haven for people who don't find that kind of love in the world. I believe it could be that. Have you been loved by Jesus today? Have you responded lovingly to his love for you? Are you committed to showing his love to others? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you now in Jesus' name, and we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only Son to show this wondrous love that would cause you to give the darling of heaven to unloving sinners. And yet, Lord, we're thankful that in doing that, we have been saved by grace through faith, many of us here. And there's operating in us now. We've been made partakers of the divine nature. Agape love dwells within us. And dear God, forgive us when we do anything that blocks it, that hinders it, that that does not, if, if we're not just provoking the outflow of that in large measure, God help us to do so. And for those here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, who want to love, who want to be loved, oh, God, come upon them even now. Show them your love in a saving way, bringing them to repent of sin and trust in Christ, commit their lives to him, and then enter this, this journey this journey where we say, this is love. <laughs> Not that we loved God first, but that he loved us and gave Jesus. And then we show how the gospel, when it finds entrance in our hearts and minds and lives, changes everything. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.